Hello all, welcome to Now We're Talking with Doug Paget. today's edition, one of those weekly conversations I have with John, Doug and John in the morning. We talk about news items, always something of great importance, and this week the great importance is this effort, tour, campaign of sorts that I'm helping to put together around encouraging people to vote for the common good, especially people who come from Christian backgrounds, that they would be encouraged to take seriously their engagement in the political system this November, November 6th. And uh, there's a lot of us who feel like we've been complicit in a Christian culture that allowed Donald Trump to become the president and a whole lot of policies to be inflicted on this country that we're not happy with. So putting together a campaign to respond to that, and um, it seems like it's going to be rather exciting. Still a lot of details to work out, but it's coming together. But here's the rest of the show, Doug and John in the morning. Thanks for listening. We are live, my friend. In the morning with Doug and John. Doug and John. Good morning, Doug. Good morning, buddy. Hey, uh, happy Friday morning to you, breaking our rhythm. Thank you for your uh, flexibility. Oh, I, I, you know, I'm renowned for my flexibility. Yeah, you have. It's, it's, been, uh, it's been one of your greatest features, I think. Yeah. John will do about anything. John will do about anything, anytime. Oh, I thought you meant gymnastically. I was sure you were going to say, I thought you meant in the bedroom. (laughs) Oh, boy. That's what I would have. My reputation precedes me. That's right. Hey, well, I am still, John, in Grand Junction, Colorado. Uh, Last week when we talked, uh, I was here um, at this hotel at the Holiday Inn and Suites in Grand Junction, Colorado. Since then, I've been different parts of Colorado, but now back to the same hotel. Uh, It is a... uh, it is a Groundhog Day kind of experience for me on that front. Is it the same hotel room? That is an interesting question. You know the thing about these hotel rooms? <laughs> that doesn't matter. <laughs> I would have no idea unless, you know, I mean, somehow I randomly remembered the room number. Uh, Doug, your hotel room looks like a hotel room in a video game of a hotel. <laughs> you know, they don't put a whole lot of detail in it, into it, just enough yeah. so that you know you're in a hotel. Yeah, it's, it's really, I mean, there's the artwork. And the great thing about that artwork that's back there. Yeah, I don't think there's anything great about that. It is uh, screwed into the wall. Oh. Like, they, they, they're just going to make sure that you're not, that, that you're not going to steal that, that you're not going to steal that artwork. Uh, and, and, and how would you, <laughs> how did you figure that out? Well, there's bolts on the on it. I mean, there's screws. Oh, you can you, see it, and and you know, you know, maybe I was, some, maybe I was poking around at testing, it, asking myself, it? That, yeah, maybe I was saying, hey, what are the chances I could take that little, dar- mm-hmm. that little darling home with me? Sure. All right. Well, hey, hey, um, I don't think people often know that when we do these conversations, like this morning, that I have just awakened here in Grand Junction, Colorado. You, my friend, have been up all night. I have, yeah, since uh, seven, well, since six last night. Yeah, you, you should you should tell people uh, uh, why that is. What kind of uh, party lifestyle a fifty one year old like you leads that keeps you up all night? And uh, how I do it, uh, looking this good. Yeah. Um, well, no, I work at a company that uh, reads X rays at night over the internet. Um, it's a this brand of uh, a medicine called teleradiology. So, um, so instead of a hospital having to uh, pay a radiologist um, to only read a handful of x-rays, because that's when their volume is low, um, they can pay us to, you know, have a you know, radiologist who's in their bedroom or in their basement or at some office somewhere, exactly, um, read those x-rays. And so I help facilitate all of that, um, and the volume of our business is, in, is at night. So I work nights now. So you have been up all you, – you go to work at like 9 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, work through the night, uh, and then you do yeah, this in uh, the morning. Yeah, 7, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, this morning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, and what time is it where, you, where uh, you're at right now? That's a great question. It's, uh, I always have to look at different devices. I'm, I, I get nervous that m- any of my computer or iPhone don't, you know, they don't adjust. But it's 8, 16 a.m. on June 1st for our little good morning chat. Yeah. 
boy, this, I mean, there's just so much uh, stuff that just uh, happens um, around the world that uh, I go, oh, wow, that's, oh, wow. And um, it's, it's, it's just a little hard to pare this down uh, to be uh, relevant, you know? Yeah. Or you could just concentrate on all the dark stuff and you're like, gosh, you don't want to do that. There's a lot. It is a lot. It is a lot. I, I, I had a little bit of good news this week, though, this event that I was out here for, this uh, sure. thing we're doing. I'm a the, part the of the check cleared. I'm a part of a. That's right. The check cleared. I can get to work. Uh, the the group that I'm uh, been with in Colorado this week is this effort that this beautiful little ad hoc group that's come together called Common Good Christians, and it's people that think that there should be common good not only in our faith as in as a Christian person that faith that I profess to hold is supposed to be good for everyone. It's supposed to be about the common good and not just good for the adherence to the faith, right? Well, um, well, from your lips to God's ears, yeah. Doug. Wouldn't that be nice if, if, all yeah. of our, if all of our religions, and some of them do it really well, so we're trying to learn from all those people you know, who, do, who do it well, who do it so well. And we also think that there's a common good that's necessary in the political life. And so we have been meeting to try to uh, encourage and call and remind uh, people of Christian faith especially evangelical Christian faith, progressive evangelical Christian faith, even more specifically, that they should engage in the common good. So we're going to launch a tour this fall, September through November 6th, that encourages people all around the country to vote for the common good. And uh, we're going to hit the road, and we're going to be uh, doing everything we can to gin up good, good spirit, goodwill, to have a little penance moment for those of us who know what we did, who know what our, can find our fingerprints on how we've allowed the religious community in the United States. You know, nearly 60% of all Christians, maybe 70 or 80% of self-professing evangelicals supporting um, Donald Trump seems out of line with uh, caring about the common good to a lot of us, or it seems incongruent with our faith. So anyway, we're, we're hitting the road. There's going to be a bunch of us involved that, that all, um, really has started to coalesce and come together this week. So there's a little bit of hope for me, at least, and what I feel like I'm up to. Um, and uh, I think taking uh, Doug and John in the morning on the, on the road this fall would be a real kick in the pants. I'm, I'm liking the sound of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that sounds like a, a, a great idea. In fact, um, the, um, the lack of um, accountability between denominations and tribes of Christianity is, is one of the reasons why, um, you know, I'm not don't consider myself a part of that anymore oh. is, is that, um, uh, a one group can just sit back in their own, uh, world of faith and having a great time while another of their brothers, um, you know, are doing like crazy shit and there's no like, well, Hey, they do their stuff. We do our stuff. And that's just how it is, you know? Yeah, it's really it's really a thing. Like it, it, it is, a, I, and I get religion. I you know I'm in the I'm in the profession. It's my thing. It's what I do, and I understand so well how powerful it is for identity, how important it is for personal connection, um, how, how much it creates a sense that people can be with one another, and uh, that it comes from a lot of heritage. It comes from a lot of um, uh, uh, the the country you, your people were from had their own, tr- her own their own religious expression you know yeah uh, all yeah, the all of them made up, you... up here you see those flavors you know the swedish type lutheran churches and whatnot right all those denominations yeah. they most all of them have some sort of a founder or leader and often comes from an ethnic or a um a national expression so fair enough that's that's what religion should do but that uh, the christian faith at least demands, it calls, it implores, it begs, it empowers you to be connected into the common good, uh, that, that you are a part of the whole family of humanity and the family of whatever there is in the cosmos, I guess, that you're part of it all. That the whole point of your faith is to call you beyond that more tribalistic expectation that your, that your personal group gives you, right? That's the whole point. Like if you didn't need religion, if, if your religion doesn't call you to something uh, more grand with everyone else, then just use the tribal connections that, that made your religious brand its brand. But that content of the Christian faith 
ought to call you into the common good, ought to call you into the, the common wealth of God, into the common good of God, this, this kind of thing, it seems to me. And, and well, yeah, I mean, instead Jesus of story for sure, in, instead of drawing, you know, people to, to this, uh, to the unifying good that uh, can be found in, in God. Um, instead, it seems like a lot of the groups, they, um, uh, they unify around what is the enemies of their, you know, of their faith, you know, the world and, you know, and fundamentalism um, uh and, uh, you know, liberal ideas and, and whatever, like that is the thing that it, it's not like, hey, what unifies us together, but it's like this is what separates us because we're against this and that. Yeah, it's 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 part of the problem with the God narrative, right? Um, that it, you, you tend to feel like you want to be the chosen one. And and there's nothing wrong with feeling like the chosen one if that's a stage of development for a period of time you're chosen, then you realize maybe it's not just me, maybe it's also them, and then maybe there's actually no choosing at all. Maybe we're all the chosen oh, ones. Now, it's crazy talk now, Doug. Crazy talk. I heard a great line this week on this, on this little theological point. That's, Some, too, co- that's too common. I, I'm going to steal it for, my, for myself. Uh, I'm going to try to use this, so I'm trying to set up times where people would say, I, I, don't, know, uh, I don't know if you're fully supporting Jesus's divinity, the divinity of Jesus, right? I want, I want to push people to make me ask that question because I heard someone's response to that statement. And this person apparently, this is the rumor anyway, this person said, oh, I'm unwilling to question anyone's divinity. Isn't that a great line? Yeah. I'm unwilling to question anyone's divinity. Uh, that's, that's, that's the way I feel about it. I think the whole point of recognizing the, the, the God connectedness of Jesus is so you'll recognize the God connectedness of us all. If the God connectedness of Jesus only limits you or, or keeps you there, it seems that you've just, to me, it seems like you've missed the whole point of what Jesus was getting at. And so anyway, we're, uh, we're going to hit the road and ask people to join in the common good and vote for the common good. And, and this is where it gets really interesting, right, is that um, we're, we're connecting that political angle to faith the way that a lot of uh, Christians get uncomfortable, you know, when, when other people do it. And um, it's, uh, I, I've never had a problem with it. It's never seemed to me, because I think, poli- can, can I give you a little rant on politics for a minute? I, I think oh, of please. all of our social organizing of uh, of the the different uh, parts of our of our culture that we organize, a family, I guess an individual would sort of be the most base. It's just sort of me how I organize my own life, and then uh, I, so when I'm thinking about myself, that's probably the smallest group I'm ever thinking about. Then your yeah. family becomes the next larger group that you think about, and that's really important. And then it might be your uh, say your business is another way we organize your businesses. Think about another. A ring larger of a group. Who are your customers? It's a good way to organize. Nonprofit organizations want to think about a little larger group, not just my customers, but the people who I want to help and benefit around the world or in my city. The circle gets a bit larger, but it's still not everyone. Politics is the organizing principle by which we say we have to consider the well-being of everyone. In our strata, this is how we how we organize, that we should be thinking about what's good for everyone. So if it's local politics, you think about, I guess, everyone in your city. If it's county politics, you have to consider everyone in your county. State politics, obviously. And then national politics, someone, the federal government, should be thinking about the everyone. And then international politics should think about how we engage around the world. And it's actually at that level that international thinking about everyone that has the closest call to what Jesus would say of think about and care for the whole world. Just as God loves the whole world, so should you. So strangely, the Christian faith calls you into something more like that federal or uh, international level of connection rather than the personal or family level or even nonprofit level. So I I just think as organizing principles, uh, government and politics— is the largest thing. And, and on our little tour that we're going to, well, not our little tour, on our massive, massively important tour. Uh, the, I, in I, 10 I, city in 10 cities? Yeah, yeah hitting up all 10, all 10 small towns across Kansas or something. That, that, that's a live album by Ted Nugent. Uh, really? Yeah. Wouldn't that be some irony? Yeah. <laughs> Ted Nugent has lost his bearings, it seems to me. Right. Uh, that there, are, I, I like to think of three P's when it comes to this 
political thing, because, you know, preachers. Um, there's politics, which I think is this big, large container. But then there's policy, what you particularly want your laws to be, and then partisanship, that you want to be part of a particular group. Maybe you want to be in a third party, or you want to be a Bernie crad, or you want to be a, a Republican or a Democrat. And those are all important at different levels. Our particular tour is not going to be partisan. It's anyone who's for the common good. It's not even going to be focused only on particular policies. There's so many policies we support, and we're not going to lock in on particular outcomes. It's rather that call for people to be part of the larger body politic in a whole new way. And that will lead people to particular policies, that will lead people to perhaps some choice of a political party, one over the other. But we're going to ask people to be, and if you're looking at policies or, or partisan candidates, do they represent the common good? And if so, you vote for them. So we are uh, going to hit a tour on this big, it's going to be truly political in that biggest sense of the, of the term. So I'm working on my stump speech. I, I thought one of those P's was going to be patchouli. But anyway... <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I feel, I feel uh, you know, tired but, um, because it's been a long week, but really in both. Well, it sounds like it's, it's yeah, like you're uh, um, it's being fruitful. You're actually uh, doing, planning stuff. Planning stuff. Hashtag <clears throat> vote common good. We've got a little website uh, we're going to be launching. I think this is going to be URL, you know. Uh, organizing is always, um, always a bit of give and take. Uh, but we kind of like this notion of uh, common good news. Like you could see a bunch of preachers hit the hit the road for the common good, preaching the common good news. See what we did there? We connected the common good to the good news. I guess the joke sort of. Hey, sort of that seven, that took seven to days. Was that was that on day seven? You, you came up with that one. Day six on day seven we rested. Good. Uh, how about you, John? Well, what, what are you seeing in the world that's um, not only depressing you but perking you up. Um, yeah, well, a little bit of both, but probably, you know, more of the former. Um, well, I'll just open up with um, uh, the world's uh, Britain's barmiest race. You probably have uh, seen news on this. I have not. The, the annual cheese rolling uh, race in Gloucester um, was won by soldier Chris Anderson, 30, who has now taken home the coveted double Gloucester cheese 21 times over the past 14 years. I'm not sure about the math. I guess it's not an annual thing. They maybe have several runs or something like that. But anyway, this guy is the um, uh, Bruce Jenner of uh, cheese chasing. Um, thousands stood along Cooper's Hill to watch uh, Britain's barmiest annual bank holiday event on Monday. Anytime there's like a national day off, they call it a bank holiday over yeah. there. Like that determines... You know, if the banks are closed or not, right? If it's a holiday or not. Hundreds participated in an event in which uh, this time included locals. See, in the past, the locals were banned uh, from oh. the competition due to <laughs> hooliganism. It's, and in it's fact, getting it, personal, people. We have to ban oh, the locals. Yeah. Exactly, because they get all you know, uh, liquored up and uh, go for it. And so, Doug, how far when my get up and go has got up and went? I hanker for a hunk of cheese. Wow. Or anytime I'm weak in the knees, I hanker for a hunk of, a slab, a slice, a chunk of, a snack that is a winner, and yet won't spoil my dinner, I hanker for a hunk of cheese. Yahoo. You know, I can picture you in a big pair of cowboy boots and a cowboy hat. I get your humor. Uh, you, so that happened. You, you know, one of the things that, that, that happened, thinking of back to like our childhood, which is where that campaign for promoting cheese uh, was yeah. so fun. fun. Um, I wake up with this. Uh, it's kind of embarrassing to even say it, but I wake up with this big pimple on the side of my nose, right in the crease. Hurts. Whitehead. I can't see it. I no. can't see it at all. And honestly, if, if at age 15... Someone had told me that age 51, you're going to wake up and still have a big white head on the side of your nose. I, 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 don't, I don't think I would have made it through adolescence. The only hope I had was someday this will end and to be brought right back into it. And literally hearing that, you know, that hanker for a hunk of cheese and feeling the soreness on the side of my nose. It's enough to make a guy have a, have a yeah, panic yeah. attack. 
Uh, hey, John. What I, do you I, got? I, I found yeah. a little no- news article I thought was interesting. Uh, made me think of you uh, as my atheist friend, which I think will strike you as, as not such good news. And that is that the appeals court in the United States of America, a, a, uh, the sixth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeal, a three-judge panel, upholds the use of in God we trust on United States currency. Yep. It somehow does not violate the separation of church and state and does not force you as an atheist to have to participate in that statement on the currency based on the argument that you can write a check, you can use a credit oh. card or you can PayPal someone the money. That was the that's the new rule that that's the new argument that they that uh, the the three judge panel used. I think that shows just a little favoritism to God. I mean like what cuz he was first he's like hey, sorry you know it, I was first, so my name's on the money forever. Yeah, and which they like added in like 1957 or 56 or something. You know, <clears throat> it, it hasn't even been on there. It was it was all part of the the communist pushback that we put in God we trust on our currency. Mm. Yeah, That's I remember real, reading yeah. about that. Some some, some um, new thing. I, I I I thought of you though. I thought you know my atheist friends don't want to have to to participate in the legal uh, currency exchange in the United States. They shouldn't have to be passing a note. That has another another statement on it. I, I'm one, you know, as a as a Christian, I, I would say I think we should get that off of our currency as well. First of all, it's inaccurate. It's not even. It's not, you know, well, it's, it's not even true. There's, there's nothing about the system as it exists that where there's a faith element to it. Yeah. Like 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 hope hope. <laughs> right. It's, it's, in it's like the, you got the money or you don't. You know that's. Yeah, it's it's not like the currency you're handing someone is based on God. It's based on you know, like the the full faith and promise of the Federal Reserve. Right? It's, it's, I think it doesn't say that on the money too. Yeah, I think it, I think I don't have any money around here, but uh, isn't that uh, isn't that something that we're still? And speaking of keeping up with the with with the old days, we are now one state away from finally passing. The Equal Rights Amendment. Can you remember this from our childhood? The big E R A slogan. Oh yeah, yeah. Apparently- yeah. I didn't really know know what was going on, but I know they were stirred up. Oh man, when you were a kid, you were just like e- equal rights for everyone, which at that point meant specifically women. They've been pushing since apparently 1923 to. <laughs> Uh, enshrine as an amendment to the United States Constitution, and they got to hurry because Donald Trump is going to chew that thing to shreds before before they get this final one passed. They want to add this amendment right right up there with the First Amendment and the Second Amendment. This Who, e- who's 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 the holdout? <laughs> well, I didn't know this until so just uh, the other day. It was Illinois that pushed it to one to the needing of one more state. Apparently, you have wow. to have two thirds of the states to ratify um, a new amendment to the Constitution. So it like has to go through something at Congress, and then it has to go be ratified by the states, and then signed. I think I think signed by the president. Maybe that's not true, um, but st- twenty or uh, uh, two thirds majority of the states have to ratify it. Oh, so there's a bunch of states that are like, oh, we're still thinking about it. A bunch of holdouts. <laughs> so here's the list of holdouts. <clears throat> Utah, Arizona. Shock. Missouri. Not surprising. Wow. Oklahoma. I bet the, I bet the Missourians just don't understand it. Uh, it. As you can tell, it's all the states that are starting with a uh, at the end. Arizona, Missouri. I pronounce it the way the Missouriites. Utah. Do. Utah. <laughs> Oklahoma. Uh, Alabama. Mississippi. Arkansas. Louisiana. Georgia. Florida. I just had no idea all these places. South Carolina. North Carolina. Virginia. I, I mean, honestly, this is just striking me now, all these states that start with this. I, I think it's kind of all of them. Uh, You're sounding like the riddle master from NPR. What's that guy's name yeah. from the New York Times? Uh, yeah, Will Shorts. Will Shorts, right. Yeah, I like Will Shorts. Okay, so those are the states. Utah, Arizona, Missouri, Oklahoma, Arizona, 
or sorry, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina. That whole little segment. Got a condo those, made of stona. See, see them all down there? Those are all the It's that whole little pocket down there. So now that, that the Illinois AKA legislature the has, has ratified it, we're down to those. And they think Arizona could be the next one to tip, or Virginia. Ooh. They're kind of at a race. And so now there's this public pressure, which I would like to add my voice to. Which one of those states is finally going to be the one that's going to push uh, the Equal Rights Amendment into the Constitution for sure? So these legislators are, are meeting to say, are, do we want to be the ones? And if they think that, have, that proclaiming equal rights for women should be a constitutionally, a constitutionally supported right, um, they, they, they'll get to be the, um, the, st- the state that pushes it over the edge. I wonder, out of all of those states, how many of them have illegal weed? Oh, isn't that interesting? You think there's a think there's a connection? <laughs> Maybe. I, I I don't know. Um, I guess um, uh, my my vote would be um, uh, Virginia. You think Virginia is going to do it? It's hard it's for a- me to believe that Virginia still has not ratified. <laughs> Uh, the equal. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it fell out of favor. There's a, there's a big long story about um, uh, it. Sort of lost some lost some energy as a. Oh, as a, you think? <laughs> yeah. Or, like the, all of these um, of these big movements from the 1960s and 70s that still languish in 2018 is amazing to me. That they can still be hanging around and not uh, have have not become. A full part of the consciousness or the or the law of this country. It's amazing how slow it moves. So equal rights, equal rights to them all. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great story. Well, I, I want to talk about um, Roseanne a little bit. I was going to ask you if you had taken an Ambien to prepare yourself to <laughs> get to sleep this afternoon because I did not want a racist rant to break out from you. Um, yeah, those damn fins. Um, what do you think's going on with that, Roseanne? Is she, is she just a racist? Is, is that just the deal and it's going to come out because that's how it is? Um, okay, okay, so I, I do think that she has some mental health issues, um, <clears throat> that either those were, uh, drug, um, um, you know, Induced, uh, and do well. I mean, like damage, um, or um, you know, or maybe she just has you know some sort of um, you know bipolar issue or something like that. I don't, and I'm not trying to, you know, good or bad. But I've heard interviews with her, um, like on the jo- Joe Rogan podcast, and and you can you can sense this very pleasant and kind of fun person. Mm-hmm. But just has this weird, quirky, dark side, this um, pre uh, uh, predilection to conspiracy theories. She's like way into that, you know. So, um, so you know, as the story goes, I'm sure it's uh, well traveled by now. Well, some, that, some people um, may have missed it. Going to want to do a quick recap, as far as you understand it. I, I've I've heard bits and pieces for sure, but so she sent out a tweet that basically um, said that. Uh, Obama advisor Valerie Jett, uh, Jarrett was the spawn of the Muslim Brotherhood and the Planet of the Apes. And, um, and then Valerie Jarrett is an African-American person. And so um, this was upsetting. What, what, what brought and, this on? Do, do you know? Like, why, why did Roseanne, who I think should be fairly busy, why did she, why was she thinking about Jarrett? <clears throat> what was the... What 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 stirred well, up I, Valerie Jarrett in her in her brain? I mean, th- the layers that you have to go to just to get to that point because it's like not only are you, you know, obsessing or you know to the point of crafting humor around a you know a, a prior um, right. administration and their staff that only a small. So obscure, of, yeah. A very, it's so it's so obscure, um, but you know, there's people who live in that world, okay. And I think you know that that is like, 
you know, I don't know, some people go to Reddit and, you know, look up, uh, 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 you know, anime, you know, and that's how they spend their time, you know. Uh, but she, so she, go, I believe that she goes to those areas. That's where her fun, her energy is or, or, or whatever. And, um, and, and I think this is the thing about her um, is that that's why it makes this so kind of like titillating. It's like, like, well, how do, what is this coming from? Like, right. you know, what is, there's nothing in the news about Valerie Jarrett or that or anything, you know. Well, that's, is that right? Like, it wasn't like Valerie Jarrett was out or she didn't have a book come out and talked about Obama or anything like that? There was no... No. No. There, no. there, there was nothing prompting it. She just randomly decides to pick an advisor. Yeah, she's like going to, like, name drop Vince Foster just any time, you know, and you'll be like, what? What's yeah. that? Yeah. So, um, so uh, ABC um, it prompted them to uh, cancel um, the uh, the series, and it's the second most popular um, television show in America, next to um, This Is Us, which is now like in rerun. So, um, is like a well, huge. And, and as I understand, I heard thing. an interview with the woman who's um, on Roseanne is like the sister mm -hmm. plays the sister. And yeah. that's the only reason I know anything about it. And apparently, the sh do you know the show, the the new Roseanne, the Roseanne reboot? I've, never, I've not seen any of it. No. Apparently, but they, I'm... they take on all the all the uh, is political issues currently happening. And mm -hmm. Roseanne on the show, her character is a Trump supporter, and her sister is not. So that's kind of the that's sort of the all in the family like crisis, right? That comes up all the time uh, in the storyline of the show. Is that she is, and I think Roseanne is actually a Trump supporter, mm -hmm. and so the show's popularity was signifying how many people are actually um, supportive of Trump via Roseanne's character on that show. And she's I, the thing is, unlike Archie Bunker on All in the Family, where the the actor was playing a caricature to show mm -hmm. the absurdity of it. That that's not true for Roseanne, and that's why Trump was so supportive of the show and has injected himself. Is that all true? Is that is do I have that right as far as yeah. you know? Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and uh, like that, like that kind of comedy, uh, just not my bag, right? I mean, that is uh, not good to me. But um, but I understand that they it was it had a balance to it. Um, oh. Where you know both liberal and conservative uh, uh, topics were um, were lampooned, oh, okay. um, it had um, some very uh, you know left leaning producers. Wanda Sykes was a producer on it, and she's a, a black lesbian comedian. Um, Whitney Cummings, um, who uh, like uh, was the producer of this show called uh, uh, Two Girls, something with two girls. Anyway, it was, it was two broke it was huge. girls. Two broke girls, so she like Pretty wrote much, and yeah. produced that. So, like she's huge and in demand. So, they spared no expense in get in getting these producers and writers who, you know, are not uh, you know uh, re Republican or okay. conservative at all. And um, so, and I think maybe that was kind of part of the appeal is that it just wasn't going to be this you know, um, you know this Trump supporter. Um, 24 seven, but there was, you know, all of these other dynamics that yeah. were going on in the show. So when I first heard about, you know, heard about it being a uh, canceled, you know, I, I got to admit at first it was like, cause I didn't really, you know, I don't like that stuff, you know? Um, and I'm like, okay, well, good, good for you. You know, Trump supporter, get that or whatever. Um, but then I really kind of wanted to think about like, what is like going on um, the flesh out what went wrong here apart from me just, you know, really yeah. loving my schadenfreude, you know? And, and I, I think this is what's going on here. I think I, what you see is time and time again, um, conservator, conservatives attempt to be witty. Mm. But rather than being, like, sharply illuminating or um, cutting, they often come across as uh, brutish, and in the end, you're, it's just, this is eye-rollingly dull. It's, you know, and so, for example, like, you know, Trump advisor Kelly Sadler, you know, who, talking about John McCain, said, you know, oh, who cares? He's going to die anyway. Right. Now, that was like a private comment in a small room, you know, and, uh, um, and I think people should have the freedom to do that, whatever. 
But, you know, when it's brought into the light, you're kind of like, wow, man, that's, you know, that's harsh. You know, and then Kanye recently said, um, you know, when you hear about slavery for 400 years, man, that sounds like a choice, you know. Like, he's trying to be insightful. He's trying to put a, a witty spin on, mm. you know, like, cast a light. On, but it's just like, you know, it, it totally it fails. Um, now, Doug, Aristotle said that um, well, here we go. wit, yeah, that wit is educated insolence. And so I think in, 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 pe- in people... And, and, and does... no one knew wit quite like Aristotle. I mean, I don't know if you know, but there's some, there's some uh, writings of his stand-up stuff that he was doing at the pools and the baths. It was really... Oh, he was slaying. He, he was, was just slaying them. <laughs> he was a crusher. Uh, <laughs> But I think in people's desire to be um, insightful and, tr- and to be um, clever, um, this is what I wrote. Okay, this is really yeah. just shit. It says, they become insightless. Insightless. And the desire to become insightful, yeah. to become insightless, because they lack circumspection. Uh, circumspection. Oh. And so, like, when, when Aristotle said it's educated insolence, mm-hmm. you know, there's you've got to be educated. And I, so I think... People oftentimes when they try to be witty, they're not circumspect. They don't see, mm. you know, that, I think that's part of wit is that there's an air tightness to it when it works. You're like, okay, even, okay, that burned really good or, boy, that's clever. You know, it's, but not here. And I think um, when, you're, when you're full of yourself like Kanye or you're blinded by your desire to cut someone down or you're playing to your audience like – Roseanne, you don't examine the entirety of a scenario because you, you just don't care. Yeah. yeah. The thing that's scary about it, there's a lot of ways to not care, right? Um, so you could not care about, like, uh, language appropriateness. Right? This is where I would put the Samantha B comment mm-hmm. when she referred to Ivanka Trump as a feckless cunt. Uh-huh. Right is she's just like I, I don't care I'll I'll use that word that's that's crass so she's just gonna blow through and got in a lot of trouble and I think she should because it just feels like that's Up over the line that's a There's... cringe that's a cringe level that we've mm-hmm. you know, George Carlin's old bit back in the seventies uh, you know about the seven words you can't say on TV. There's like three of them that you still can't say on TV, and I can't remember the other two. But that one, that's one of them. But she kind of blew through that, right, because she wants to blow through that convention. When you think, I will compare any person to an ape, a talking ape from the planet of the apes, if the convention you're going to blow through is the convention that compares human beings to animals— whether you're Donald Trump calling them a bunch of animals or Roseanne, yeah. call, if that's the convention you're blowing through, that shows something about a, not just a lack of being particularly or generally circumspect, but you don't actually care about that being a problem. Unlike, I don't care about people being bothered by a particular um, use of a, of a, of a slang. That's mm-hmm. not a slang. Like you, you cannot be Roseanne Barr and not know that that is something that o- only seems funny if you think that there's some re- some truthfulness in this in this idea. You, you know what I mean? I mean, like it's it's just a, it's at a different level. It seems to me that that and and that's what shows someone's bias, prejudice, or racism. So I would have the same thing would be true in me. I'm sure things that I would be like, oh, is that. Yeah, that probably isn't something I should have said because I didn't know that that overstepped the line, right? Um, yeah. You know, when someone uses the phrase, like when I, when I was growing up, people would use all kinds of phrases uh, in slang that I realized are like racial. Oh, boy, yes. You know, and I'm not going to get into all of them, but we would say things like, oh, that little cotton picker or that cotton picking thing. Like, yeah. I didn't even know what. We, we have creeping Charlie in our backyard. No, what is that one? I don't even know what that means. It's a crab. It's like a crabgrass. Yeah, well, I know and, what it is. It's crabgrass, oh. but what's what's it referencing? <laughs> it's a crab like grass. the Japanese. And the, I was worried about your yard. You, oh, oh no, you have crabgrass. The Japanese dug in. They're you know in the in the forest and you know in the islands. It's just like you can't you know, and then you can't get rid of it. Creeping Charlie. Yeah. See, cotton picker. Uh, 
somebody gypped someone. I didn't know that that was a reference to gypsies and that mm-hmm. gypsies, which is the Rom- a reference to Romani- people from Romania, and that they're mm-hmm. going to steal from you because they're, they're, they always do that, that they're shrewd little thieves. So that's what we... Like, okay, but once you wake up to the fact of that, there's no possible way Roseanne Barr doesn't know that you can't compare human beings to apes. <laughs> like, that is just not... If you're that level of insensitive or, or that level of uninformed... You should probably step away from the public eye and until you wake the fuck up, right? Like, there's just no reason for that to be. Uh, well, you know, and in in that in her world, and and like like to to certain people in that basket of horribles, um, you know, like she's like talking, you know. Uh, they're that language, you know, I mean, like, they're like, oh, yeah, I get that. All right. Oh, that's a good, like, they, they see the humor um, um, in that. And later on, uh, she did claim that she did not know that Valerie Jarrett was black, that she thought she was like Arabian and Italian or something like that. I don't know. Then what was the Planet of the Apes reference? What could it have possibly meant? Which, by the way, was a great movie. It's still, it's, it's burned into my consciousness when they round that corner on that beach and they see that that, Statue of Liberty is laying in the harbor, and mm-hmm. and uh, Charlton Heston pounds that sand. Yes, and, and, and so for people who haven't even seen the original Planet of the Apes, let alone the the very um, the, the the much more violent version. Yeah, yeah, the newer one. Uh, not not um, to become a movie critic about somehow we've even taken the Planet of the Apes, which was supposed to be a critique of nuclear weapons, and have turned it into some kind of group of, of very cool-looking computer-generated uh, uh, characters that can fire w- uh, automatic weapons. Like, like that, that whole thing, I'll go on a rant on that sometime, about all these, this classic imagery that was supposed to be social consciousness-raising about things that could destroy our planet has now become just an action film. Sure. Which is not, which um, is not the point, obviously, of, of Roseanne's. So let me close out my point on this. I got, like... Another paragraph. Oh, very good. Excuse me. Here, here, well, here's the thing. Um, like, uh, it, it, these gaffes, mm-hmm. um, it's not because these people aren't intelligent. Like, wit is not drawn from the sh- necessarily from the strength of intelligence. And it's not that they're completely broken mm-hmm. characters. Like, you know, because she said this, you know, like... Um, because I bet there's a part in her that genuinely feels love for all people. Yeah, of course. You know, but there's this other dark side of her that, that comes out. Um, it's just that when you when you combine meaning and insight into a unique perspective, um, it's not easy. Comedy is not easy to do that and say things in a clever way. Even for a seasoned comedian like Roseanne Barr, um, who you would think would, would be able to... Uh, a write a master's course on comedy right. or on someone like Kelly Sadler, who has a master's degree in communication and a BA in Chinese. She's not dumb. You know, it's just this ability to craft that is, is hard and, and it's difficult, but when you're blinded by, you know, your bias, um, these things come out and it's just, uh, yeah. you know, painful. Yeah, that's 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 well said, John. Um, you, you know what I don't understand about someone like Roseanne Barr, though, on this case, with her level of success, why is she trying to be funny in a tweet? You have the most highly rated television show right now. Do you really need your Twitter followers to? Uh, if she's just playing the comedy line, what's mm-hmm. she doing going on Twitter to try to be funny about some obscure political character? This is where I, I don't know that the failure was just comedic. Yeah, oh, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Why is she in this conversation at all? And why is she trying to make her chop? If she was a young upstart comedian that's trying to get a following on Twitter, fair enough. Mm-hmm. But that's not even a funny line that yeah. someone is the love child or whatever she phrased it mm-hmm. between the Muslim Brotherhood Let's talk about super obscure, like political movement from uh, from Syria, 
and the planet of the apes, it, it, that's not, first of all, it's not even funny. There's nothing funny about that. It's insulting. The, at well, the, here, at the best, it's just simply a burn or an insult. So, I, I, the, the, the deeper story to that quote is that there, um, uh, I don't know, like these extreme conservative Republicans. Um, believed that uh, Jarrett was a Muslim and that it was her intent to counsel the president um, to be more sensitive or whatever towards um, situations that involve Muslims. So, I mean, that's like, but still, again, this is something like from, I mean, it's like so ancient history. Yeah, Uh, I mean, Valerie Jarrett, as a political um, uh, follower and someone who, who, who just likes it the way people like sports, uh, I know who Valerie Jarrett is and think very highly of her and understand how that works. And but what, do you think that f- Twitter followers of Roseanne are deep inside of who were the deep influencers of Barack Obama's care for including everyone in the country and his approach to Iran? That, like, it gets even more bizarre that that would be funny. Uh, it it's it seems to me that no it's it's part of a more choreographed attempt to try to slander and besmirch the reputation of the president um uh, the, the past president and mm-hmm. so uh, just to me it's like you don't get you don't get a pass on that one Roseanne well yeah. I, I have a headline that might might explain some of this oh yeah yep from Uproxx, U-P-R-O-X-X, that, that very famous news outlet, I think might come out of Australia. The headline, you have a second brain in your butt. Apparently, they found mm. in, in mice, and they think this is true in adults or in humans as well, that your, your nervous system is not in charge of making sure that your colon, as they put it in here, expels the colon matter. That there's 400,000 neurons in your colon that operate independently from your brain to be sure that your body is releasing what's in your colon. And that it's separate, and it developed, they think, evolved before the central nervous system fully developed. So in other words, you, even if you lose consciousness or something that happens in your brain, your body is going to continue to expel. So they refer to it as a brain because it can send signals, make decisions, and cause something to happen in your body without your central nervous system. So, yeah, Boy, that's, that's very interesting because from my experience working – in uh, a neuro ICU a long ago that even when you're paralyzed, you still poop. You still poop because it's uh, a separate, which is what they've been trying to work on. And it, it has something to do also with um, uh, a number of other issues that people have, irritable bowel syndrome and some other things that are, that are intestinally related, that you have a separate uh, functional, very, very single, single-minded nervous system in your butt. So they make all these jokes in the article, of course, of course, about, you know, maybe someone is talking about, you know, it's, it's kind of talking out of their butt. Um, <laughs> yeah, literally. Mm-hmm. Maybe we should pay more attention to that. They might have uh, something good to say. Um, um, hey, hey, Doc. Yeah. Well, you going to talk more about shit? No, I'm not going to talk any more shit to you. But I was going to say, uh, on the TV front, We almost made it through like two episodes in a row without a poop story. Almost. And I, and I had one last week. And I... And I just, I put it on the shelf. Pulled it back. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I felt I feel fearful like that I have people, to wait the viewers until, might be like, what is up with that guy? I know. I, I felt like I had to wait till like minute 50 of this thing or later so that people aren't like, really? They're, they're 12 year olds, these two. They just, but, um, uh, you know, everyone you know, poops <laughs> and it really matters. As, as a man who feels like he is just having one continuous bowel movement, like there's just no end to it. Like, my next bowel movement is just a continuation of the last one. 
And oftentimes it's like, uh, you know, you know, uh, pulling a rusty chain out of my ass. I'm really interested in this story. <laughs> See if you can do some mindfulness around your 400,000 colon neurons. See if you can work up, work up a little meditation practice for those I, little I feel, hunks. I feel strangely hopeful. You've got a, you've got a whole other brain going on. You've got a, you've got a separate system. Hey, uh, but I was just going to say on the, t- on the TV front, I'm excited about early August as a return for the TV show Better Call Saul. I don't know if you watch mm. it or not, but. That was, that was no, in, my, my, in my television news, along with Roseanne and uh, Samantha Bee. No, that, that show burns a little too slow for me. Um, but mm. um, uh, Robin, my partner, um, uh, really, really likes it. And, uh, and she's shown me a couple of, uh, of scenes and stuff, um, like with um, Saul and his brother, oh, the attorney. so smart. And, and, and like in that, it was, I could really see the appeal. It is. It, and it is, for those who worry or don't even know what it's about, it's... Uh, it's an offshoot. It's a prequel to a show called Breaking Bad. One of the characters, they kind of go back in time and say, how did this person get to the point where he's a character on the TV show Breaking Bad, which is a very dark show, Breaking Bad. And it's designed to be that way. Better Call Saul is not. It's really insightful family dynamics. It's, it's just, I find it to be spectacular. I think it's one of the best television shows. Um, hey, well, th- speaking of video, I just want to b- b- put a call out to this. We don't have the technology to show the clip, um, but um, uh, there's a, a CCTV a clip of this scene, um, like on a, a train platform or something like that, where you see a flying headbutt of chivalry. So now the image, the video is a little, it's quite troubling in the sense that there's a woman on her knees on the ground. And there's a large man standing over her, striking her with a rolled up newspaper or something like that. And, you know, I mean, it's grainy and it's dark, but, you know, her hand, she's covering her. It's, you know, quite shocking. Um, But then out of nowhere, out of into the frame comes this guy who's like a Samoan rugby guy. You see him take like seven strides and then about a foot in front of the assailant, the assailant turns, the guy launches himself into the air and headbutts him to the ground. Wow. I mean, it is fantastic. And then well, some other hooligans come and yeah. beat the shit out of that guy. <laughs> Save uh, this woman. Yes, yes. So, uh, trigger warning, um, but, you know, the... the uh, the action of courage on um, behalf of that guy is, is pretty cool. To throw I wouldn't bo- recommend that, by the way. To, to throw his body and to interfere. Good, good for him. No, you do that. You do that. But don't, yeah. you, don't lead with your head, yeah. you know? <laughs> Unless you're a rugby player. I, I've known a few rugby players, and they're... He had a, he had a striped shirt on. I thought rugby. Okay, so. okay, I see. <laughs> he was just wear, wearing rugby gear. Yeah. Hey, uh, uh, I'll, I'll end with this one. You know, I, in my news feed on Flipboard... I. I subscribe to these, like, how to make yourself better boards. So I get all these articles whoa. all the time. Whoa, 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 What? Did none of that make sense? No, no. It's, you do that? I do. I, I, I well, okay. What so is I, happening to you? It's what? the low testosterone, Doug. I'm not judging you, but. Well, John, to that point. <laughs> I am actually carrying a bottle right now of, um. Natural testosterone booster. Is that a gorilla on the bottle? It's not. It's a. It's oh. a. It's a. Ro- it's a strong robot man. Oh. Because um, uh, you know I haven't been sleeping as well at night, and uh, if you Google uh, middle-aged men not sleeping at night, it's one of the suggestions. But no, the the part of the reason okay, that I sorry, subscribe. Sorry for me interrupting. Subscribe but. to this board, uh, and for those who don't know how Flipboard works, it's it's like a news aggregator, and you can pick the the topics you want, and they call them a board. And, uh, so I subscribe to these articles on, on self-improvement, mostly for this show, so I can come up with interesting things. I, I take none of these to heart. I, I actually mock them because they're such nonsense. So each week I like to bring you Oh, a little... Doug, I'm so, I'm so relieved. You feel better? I mean, yeah. I, 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 and I, I, you might not have noticed, but each of I'm our like, shows... I'm like, does Shelly know this? Does she mocked you about this too? Because she needs to get in on that. E- each of these shows I brought up something like, hey, here's a way that people say you can make yourself better. Oh, right. And so, what, 
women find attractive. With this one this of them. sort of thing. Yeah. How, how yeah. to improve yourself. Mm-hmm. Here's how ridiculous this is. Uh, this, this is the last one I've got for our, mm-hmm. our conversation today. But the, the topic is, and this is from Forbes. Okay. Five tips to help develop charisma. I thought that's a, that's actually seems kind of interesting. What what are the things that could make someone more charismatic? Well, they're all things like hey, like number one should be be more charismatic because here's what they are. Develop a sense of self confidence. <laughs> like if you oh suffer, easy if you <laughs> this is just starting off with the easy one. If you suffer Jeez. from a lack of self confidence that you have to develop so you can have charisma. I think just being self-confident, if, if you could whip up self-confidence on, on its own, uh, then just whip up charisma on its own. Like, that is, this is the kind oh, of thing that it is. I, I hope our listeners uh, relate to this because, um, I mean, like, if you are, if you struggle with not being self-confident, which I, present company accepted, um, like... Charisma, that ain't even on your fucking top ten. No. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Like if you're if top number three are about getting laid. Yeah. And then if number one is try to just have more confidence in yourself, if that's where you're starting. Mm, and and, and, and it, it literally has these sentences. Self confidence is dealt is developed through accomplishment. Knowing you're good at your job, a good family member, a good friend, or good member of your community. No, actually, self-confidence does not come from external acceptance. That's the opposite of self-confidence. That is well, external. Co- that is confidence produced by other people's response to you. The whole notion of self-confidence is that you don't need someone else's approval. When you're seeking everyone else's approval, you look desperate. You don't look like you have self-confidence. Well, this is Forbes, so they're like, you know, success is judged by your accomplishments. So, Unbelievable. Number two, be interested and be interesting. Step number two to having charisma, number one, have self-confidence. Number two, be interesting to other people. Oh my God. Like, if you just make yourself interesting, again, I don't think you have to worry. Of, uh, like you could whip up your own level of now I'm interesting. Like, unless you're making up stories about yourself, I don't think you can just make yourself interesting. Uh, you know, I mean, I get pretty interesting after four beers to me. So, you know. Yeah. This, here's, here's the sentence on that point. If you have a funny story to contribute on a subject... Tell it with an exclamation point. What? If you have the, the ability to inject a fun story in rhythm in a conversation with a group of people, I think you pretty much got charisma nailed. Like what they're doing here is describing the things that make someone charismatic and saying, do those things. This is something that would be like taped to Dexter, the serial killer's refrigerator. <laughs> Totally, totally. Number three, take a clue from those around you. Like, develop a high sense of empathy and use that in flow. Be aware of your body language. Make sure your posture is open. You're not crossing your arms or turning your back to people in a conversation. If you are turning your back to people in a conversation and that's where you have to start is noticing that, again. Number uh, number four, have a reliably positive attitude. Be positive all the time when you need to. If you want to have charisma, be positive all the time. I mean, it, this is just unbelievable. Number five, ditch your devices. Don't be looking at your phone when you're supposed to be in a conversation with people. I mean, this is the kind of self-help stuff that exists in the world for people. Stop looking at your phone. Don't turn your back on people. Pay attention to the clues of those around you. Be really interesting and have self-confidence. Then you'll be a person of charisma. Isn't it unbelievable? This is the level of help for all the technology we've developed, all the social structure, all the psychological benefit. And Forbes magazine is trying to help people. Some some fantastic editor sat down and had to come up with an article for Forbes 
And this is as close as we can come up with to making the human, the human being thrive. Yeah, I mean, maybe it should be like, you know, to a degree, don't give a shit about what other people think of you. Yeah. Just you know, go from there. Yeah, go, go from there. Just, just you do you. That should be the next article. Uh, hey, anyway. I, got one thing, I got one thing to close on, Doug, real quick. Billy Joel's front row policy. Billy Joel never sells tickets to the front row of his concerts. Over the years, he got tired of seeing, like, bored, rich people with their arms crossed, you know, entertain me, entertain me. So he said, I'm not doing that anymore. So now, Joel sends his staff to those in the worst seats in the house, fills the front row with these, uh, with these fans so that every concert he knows that the people in the front row are people who really want to be at his show. That, 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 that sounds lovely and also seriously desperate. Like, well, and I, I hear he's a dick, so pop. I don't know. <laughs> you see how it can also like, sound like a really desperate man that's just like, <laughs> I want people that are really love me to be as close to me as possible. But I really do like the idea that they would uh, well, I mean, like the, if, high, the high uh, uh, the, the the high, the high seated people. The, the, the it, far it would be uh, a pretty grand moment to be up there in the nosebleeds and have oh you gosh. know someone with a lanyard tap you on the shoulder and say, "Hey, I got a gift for you from Mr. Joel." Yeah, that's 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 very honorable. Good for him. All right, buddy. Hey, are we back on next week? You got time for this on next Thursday? Uh, yeah. Where 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 are you going to be? I will be in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We can be okay. live in the studio. All right, Thursday great. morning. You want to do it? Yeah, let's do that. I, I, I kind of want to be in, the, in space again. For, for people who, who don't know, sometimes we do it like this, and sometimes we go into the, the, the studio at the, the heart studio. of the resistance on Peacedale Avenue. And, mm-hmm. uh, so we can do it live in there. All right. In the, uh, never mind. I was going to say something about the rank of your community in the, in the state. but uh. That's right. Uh, well, hey, thanks, everybody, for paying attention. And... Um, a little shout out to Carol Burson if she listened the whole time. She made a nice comment the other day on Facebook. Did you see that? I don't know. She said, I really like Doug and John in the morning. It's, it's like sitting around with my friends over coffee. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Uh, because I like- that's real, we do that most of the time when we're in the studio. Yeah, that's, that's what I would like for people to feel like this is. And that, you know, like, like at 10 o'clock in the morning in Minneapolis, 11 o'clock in New York, uh, people are just killing an hour sitting around with us. And then people sure. who, obviously who listen on the on the podcast, uh, just the podcast version. You might want to try the... You can see all this over at um, John Music's Facebook profile and my Facebook profile if you want to see us. And um, In the Morning with Doug and John at Facebook. So go there and and like our page and uh, submit your ideas for news stories and maybe we'll uh, chat about them. Good reminder, I forgot to post this to the In the Morning with Doug and John page a little bit ago. It's new. It's new. I'll do that in a minute. But first, I have to go work on some self-confidence and try to make myself more interesting so we have some charisma so people will. Doug, your skin looks fantastic, I got to say. I mean, you, what you're doing is working. It, it, it is, I, I appreciate you saying that. You said that the other day. It is really not. Um, and it's actually quite a disaster. It must just be oh. the camera. It must be the soft glow of the, of the Zoom. The, the, that, that, maybe I have a Zoom filter good. on. I'm right. so I'm so vain uh, that acne even diffuser. <laughs> yeah. Did I show you the rough left corner oh, yeah. of my nose? Oh, I I can see it now. Yeah. Still hurts. I bet. All right. Okay. I'll see you later, guys. Bye, Doug. See you, buddy. I don't know how to make this. Yeah, everybody, just just keep hanging on. John and I are going to keep talking, but I have to figure out how to make this how to make this stop. Stop live stream. There it is. The live stream has stopped. All right, you want to stop the uh, garage band, or do you want to give people uh, a little bit of the the podcast only real blue stuff <laughs> that we can't do on Facebook? Yeah, let's uh, talk about those three other words yeah. that you can't say on the radio. All right, you ready to stop the uh, audio yeah, sure. recording? Uh, do we do, do we need to uh, uh, synchronize that as well? I don't think so. Okay. All right, but I'm just going to push stop. One, two, three. No, no, no. You hang up first. No, you hang up.